Welcome to the District Architecture Center and the fifth installment of our series, Giants of Washington Architecture. This is a series about architects who have made a difference in Washington. And we use the term giants because it refers to a quote by Sir Isaac Newton, I have seen further because I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. And I'm so delighted to have Marshall Purnell with me today. Marshall was a real rainmaker here in Washington. Um, He's done a lot of different buildings around the city, and he's been president of our chapter and president of the National AIA. But I should tell you, Marshall, the thing that I was doing as I was preparing for this, I was listening to Miles Davis, So What? And you, you've told me a story about um, how that piece of music has influenced a building here in Washington. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, before I start, I'd like to say it's, I'm glad to be here, Mary, <laughs> and I feel old enough. I think Isaac Newton was a friend of mine. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> The Pepco building and songs. You know, my dad was a jazz musician. And there was a lot of buildings actually designed in our office over 35 years while the staff was listening to jazz. And it's been said that architecture is music frozen in time. And we, for many years, thought about, can music inspire you to the point where you can design a building based upon a piece of music? And we start this debate within the office, and then we started thinking about it more and more. And you know, if uh, if architecture is music frozen in time, then a city is a symphony, mm -hmm. and a building is maybe a trio or a quartet or a quintet. You know, depending on the size of the building. Mm -hmm. So we got down to two songs, "All Blues" by Miles Davis, and "So What." And "So What" won out probably because of its name. <laughs> so. <laughs> So when did you know you wanted to be an architect? Uh, you know, I talked to my friends and they tell me they wanted to be an architect when they were 12 or I knew when I was in fifth grade. I was a junior in college. I just said, let me try this. And it was right up my alley. I could always draw. I mean, I had artwork in the bookstore at Michigan that I was selling wow. at the time. You know, I had some posters that I had drawn. So it was like I found my niche. Oh, that's great. Though you had a very musical family, that that yeah. wasn't your thing. No, everybody, my mom and I used to claim that she, we were the only ones left out. My, <laughs> mo my mother couldn't carry a tune in a basket, neither could I. <laughs> but my father could sing, my two brothers could sing. I have four kids, they all can sing and play instruments. And wow. All, uh, but I can't. You know, I can many, shoot a basketball, throw you, a football, or hit a baseball. You That's have, what I could do. You have many talents other yeah. than that. So right after college, you ended up teaching. That's you yeah, went that's straight. Yeah, my first job. Yeah, out of why college. why teaching? Well, that's another story. Um, I was married when I graduated, and my wife at the time wanted to go to medical school, and we had gone. She had gone to Michigan as well, and she got it accepted at Berkeley, wow. Howard, and a couple other medical Michigan and a couple other medical schools, and she said, "I want to go to Howard." Wow. And I said, why Howard? She says, well, I want a black experience. Mm -hmm. You know, she had gone to predominantly white schools as I had, and we were at Michigan. She said, I just want this pressure that's sort of unseen off me, and I want to go to Howard University Medical School. I said, let's go. She said, well, you don't know anybody. I said, well, I'll find a job there. So I came out looking for an apartment before she, we moved here. Mm -hmm. and. I was inspired when I was in architecture school because one of my professors and mentors had gotten a doctorate of architecture. He was the first person in the United States to get a doctorate in architecture. Mm. He was African American. His name was Dr. James Chaffers, and we're mm. friends to this day. And that inspired me because I left there with a master's degree. And when I came to Washington, um, I was looking for a program that might have a doctorate of architecture program. And I went to Howard, they didn't have one. I went to Maryland, and i walking through the halls, just in the, it was in August, just before school started. And I ran into the associate dean, Dave Fogel. And he asked, he started telling me about Maryland's program. He said, what are, you know, he said, are you a student here? I said, no, I just moved to the area. You know, I graduated from Michigan. and. Uh, I didn't tell him right away why I was looking for a doctorate program. He started telling me about the program at Maryland, what it was about, fairly new at the time. He said they didn't have a master's program, but they were looking to start a master's program. And when he said they didn't have a master's program, bells went off in my head because I had a master's degree and I needed a job. <laughs> so 
I told him I was there looking for a, you know, a faculty position, an adjunct faculty position. And he said, we just happen to have something open. We have a second That's year great. design studio open. As far as I'm concerned, you got the job. So. That's great. So then, then you went to work for AIA. Yeah. I thought about where would I go to find out more about architecture. And I knew I didn't want to go into another firm because I could have a good experience or a bad. Right. So I said, I need to find out more about it. And I thought, I'll go to the source. I'll go to the American Institute of Architects. Now, it didn't matter that I had never seen a job posted or I didn't know <laughs> where they were in the city or anything like that. I just Then I did my little research. I found out that they did have a position they were looking for in government affairs. I went down there and sort of talked my way into that. So, Because after the first almost year in government affairs, I found out the key to architecture. And what is the key to architecture? The key to architecture is start at the top and work your way down and out of the profession. I figured that if my name was on the door, I would, uh, I'd be okay. And, and what AIA taught me was how to get work. You know, where, the, where does work come from? What's the source? How do you stay in business? So when I left AIA, I was just looking for someone who would take me on as a partner and I wanted to stay in Washington because this was where my contacts were. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And how did you meet Paul Devereaux? Oh, I don't know if I can even tell you about that on camera. Oh, all right. Uh, well, clean it up. Uh, clean it up. <laughs> we were, I announced that I was leaving AIA about four months before I left, and about four months actually before the convention. Mm -hmm. And I was timing my leave around June. The convention that year, I think, was in May, and it was in Dallas, Texas. I really wanted to entertain as many offers as possible, so I figured if I put it out there that I was leaving, and, it, and true enough, when I got there, I got several offers to come and interview with a lot of firms. And Paul and I were standing at the funeral, <laughs> <laughs> and he looked over at me and he said, I know you're getting a lot of offers from all over the country, but they're going to be for jobs. He said, when you get done interviewing with everybody, come talk to me, because I'm talking about a career. Wow. So you had a, a thriving partnership and you had an office over here yeah. um, in, at, at, at a time when Penn Quarter was not yet Penn Quarter and was kind of uh, yeah. a, um, an interesting area. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah. um, how, running a business down here in that the, was, that was was the all early 80s? Um, 85. 85. We moved down here in 85. Mm -hmm. That was all by design. Um, we had gotten a job as consultants for the PADC, Pennsylvania Avenue right. Development Corporation. And we had that position. We were with Ted Mariani and Anderson Nader out of Boston. The three of us were consultants to PADC for 11 years. And in being a consultant to PADC, we did measure survey on buildings down here. We actually moved some facades and along Pennsylvania Avenue, took them down apart brick by brick and moved them. So we were down in this area a lot as a firm. And we knew that what PADC was doing, we knew that th this was going to be an up and coming area. Wow. And it was really the only way you could keep developing a downtown, so to speak, was come to the old retail downtown, mm -hmm. which is what this was at one point. Mm -hmm. So we figured if we got in early, and we did, we found this building at 8th and D, you know, it had been vacant for, he had, the guy had renovated and he couldn't get anybody in it for two years. Wow. So we negotiated a 10 year lease with two five-year options. We wound up staying there 26 years, but when we got down here, it was not the best area to be in, you know, after work in the winter when it was dark. We'd have to walk the female members of our firm to the uh, metro or to their cars. There were a lot of male prostitutes around and just seedy characters, you know, around everywhere. So. It wasn't the best place to be, but we could just see it starting to change, and, and it changed, you know, year by year. Yeah, and now it's like one now of the it's like the place to be. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So you were involved in some of the really big kind of catalytic projects here in Washington, like the baseball yeah. stadium and the convention center, and yeah. and um, how does it feel to? go to those areas now and I mean when you when you first started the convention center I mean that was on the edge and certainly the baseball stadium yeah. I mean the most exciting thing down there was the concrete plant yeah. what is um, what's it feel like now to go back yeah. there and see yeah. and see how it's changed we, we called it placemaking in the office because it was by design we went after projects that we knew that would be would would form a catalyst for change in Washington and different neighborhoods 
Uh, we started in Shaw with the Reeves Center at 14th right. and U. Uh, we knew that that would be a catalyst for change, and we went after that. The um, studio theater at the southern end of 14th Street, we knew if we got that area going, if we could get projects in those areas, we could start, you know, knitting those, the fabric of 14th Street together. Uh, the baseball stadium and the, and the convention center, the convention center was, was kind of interesting. We, we went after that, you know, I think the world went after that. It was an open competition, so every major firm in the country went after that project. But by then, Paul and I had a pretty good established reputation of doing decent work in, you know, in, in Washington. And so when we were contacted by TVS, Thompson Venture at Steinbeck, and I think they had done at that point 16 convention centers around the country, and we knew that we would be contacted by someone who had a lot of convention center experience. That's just the way it works in the profession. And right. we got the call, and we then did our research about who was their competition in the convention center world. And so we, we vetted them, and they probably didn't know it or realize it, but we did our homework to make sure that, because we got calls from other teams as well. Um, and I don't know if you remember, Mary, but the site of the convention center right now was highly contested. You right. know, Federal City Council and others said it should be over by Union Station or somewhere else, you know, out New York Avenue. Right. Um, so it wasn't the, you know, place of choice, so to speak, for a lot of people in the city. Yeah, but it's it's worked out so well. Uh, Sometimes you have to recognize what the problem is before you start designing. The problem with that project, as I see it, uh, it wasn't about beautiful architecture or something pretty or nice. It was scale. Right. It was how do you put a building that's 2.3 million square feet, bigger than the U.S. Capitol. I mean, if you look at a you know an aerial right. or satellite view of of the city, you'll see the convention center is much bigger than the U.S. Capitol building in terms of its footprint. So how do you put that on the edge of downtown and in a neighborhood like Shaw? How do you put, it's, it's basically six square blocks. So how do you put 2.3 million square feet in a neighborhood and not destroy the neighborhood? Right, so talking about Shaw, how do you feel about the Reeves Center? There's possibly gonna be sold um, because it's yeah. so, um, it's so, the land is so valuable. I mean, when you put that building in, there was nothing. Nothing there. Actually, they told us that we had to build a fortress and we had to do a building that looked inward, and as few windows as we, you know, could muster on the outside. We were, they were worried about people throwing rocks through the windows. So what did we do? Naturally, I put as much glass as we could at the building. I have it tumbling out of the atrium out to the sidewalk. I don't think they've lost one pane of glass ever from vandalism at the Reef Center. And you know you've practiced a long time when they're starting to tear your buildings down, you know. Yeah, you, but in a way that building did exactly what it was supposed to do. I mean, yeah. it made that area really, It did, know, it was a catalyst. Yeah. It won an energy award when, you know, and people weren't even thinking about that wow. at now the that's, time. Wow, now that's really uh, important. So we were very proud of that building. I, st I still am. Yeah. It was here when this community was nothing. It's, it's the right. reason this community has flourished. Well, in the middle of all this, you yeah. got involved with AIA. You were pre right. president of the, the chapter. And then you went on uh, to greater glory and became uh, the president of National AIA. Yeah. So you get this uh, cushy job at, uh, at National AIA, and there are all the worker bees back at Devereaux and Purnell are still churning out the work. And you come back from that experience, and you, you're still involved because I see you at all the big events. Yeah. Um, and you come back from that, and um, sadly, uh, Paul Devereaux passes away. Yeah. And then a couple years later, I think Barbara passes, Barbara Laurie passes yes. away. And uh, the firm kind of went through a very difficult period because you, I guess you had expected that Barbara would be kind of the new partner yeah. and kind of yeah. take things on. And do you want to talk about uh, yeah, Barbara when, at all? Uh, yeah, when uh, when Paul passed away, um, I never really wanted to practice on my own under just my name. I, you know, my my best experience practicing is none of the buildings we've talked about, or none. it's the people that I've worked with for all that time. We had four people that worked for us for, you know, twenty five plus years, mm -hmm. Barbara being one of them, Barbara Laurie. But when Paul passed away, I was looking to bring the four associates we had 
up to partnership level. So we drew up paperwork and stuff. I said, I think you need to start your own name, not Devron and Pernell. Devron DP and Partners is what they started. And within four months, Barbara oh. died. I mean, she had lupus her whole life mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, but she, she was managing that. But I, after that, I basically I went to her service and I don't think I went back to the office except to clean out my desk. Mm. I told uh, Anthony and Danny, and I said, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to be here. You know, I, I, it was hard to take. Yeah. Paul, after 32 years, and Barbara, after 27 years, just dying. It was just too much for me. Yeah, it was a, such a shock for us, too, because she was president yeah. of the foundation and had been so so vital around here. And president of the chapter. Yes, that's true. Do you remember true. how she got involved with AI? Do you remember? When I was leaving as president, you asked me, is there anybody that you know that I would suggest that should get active right now in the profession that might could be president at one day, you know, have that potential? And I said, yeah, I got somebody in my office, Barbara Laurie. Yeah. And you said, you sh Barbara Laurie? I said, yeah. And so she got, I, I went back and told her that the chapter needed her and that yeah. she needed to get active and she got active. As it turned out, she wound up president of the Washington D.C. chapter as when I was national president. Right. The same time. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was right. also a blow to the firm though. Too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we weren't, we weren't too much of a drain, but she also was teaching full time. Yeah, so she taught 17 years. She taught uh, at Howard. She's a professor at Howard. Yeah. And my friends would say, why do you let Barbara teach over there? I said, when you let her teach, I want her to teach. You know, I think it says, it speaks well of the firm that we have somebody at Howard, you know, on the faculty. So, so now you're teaching again. So you started yes. it as a teacher yeah. and now you're teaching again in, in North Carolina. How did that come about? I was doing nothing and I was trying to learn how to do that well. <laughs> I, people would say, are you retired? And I said, no, I just stopped working. And in about a year and a half, a friend of mine from uh, North Carolina State, he was the dean. Actually, it was uh, Marvin Malica, oh, who yeah. was the yeah. president after, the national president after me. I remember taking the medal off my neck and putting it around his. And he called me and he said, Marshall, I heard you closed your firm or you're not working at the firm anymore and you've been down here to crit work a couple times. He says, and I knew I could never get you to move down here when you had your firm, but I'd like to, you to come down and you know, and teach down here. And he says, and you tell me what you want to teach and we'll try and work something out, but I'd like you to consider it. He said, what are you doing now? And I said, nothing, but I'll start doing that to about noon. <laughs> so he said, come on down. I said, and I thought about it. You know, I'd been at that point, I'd been in Washington for 41 years. Mm -hmm. And I had four kids that were all born here in Washington. And I thought about it. I said, I moved to Washington without knowing a soul. I said, mm -hmm. if I move to Raleigh, North Carolina, I won't know a soul. I'll know him, and that's it. And, yeah. I, and that's what I did. I picked up and moved. That's exciting, though. Yeah. That's and it was exciting, and, I, and I've been there almost five years now, yeah. and it's a, it's a different challenge. I remember leaving teaching in 1973 at Maryland, in my mind saying, I know more than these students, but not a lot more right now. I need to practice, but this is something I enjoy. I'd like to come back to this. Well, Marshall, um, I know that you're having fun down in North Carolina, but we sure miss you around here. So thank yeah. you so much for being able to take the time to be with me today and uh, for coming into the District Architecture Center. It's good coming back <laughs> and seeing you anytime is special, Mary. <laughs> Thanks, Marshall. All right.